Our subject again is listen to a picture. From time to time, folk ask me, especially preacher friends, where do you get your subjects? Do you work with them very long? And I can truthfully say tonight that I spend a great deal of time working on a subject for a sermon. I probably give more time to that than any other particular item. I think it's very important to have the right subject. I wish that I could say tonight that I thought of this one because I like it, but I did not think of it. In Atlanta, Georgia, the other day, I was walking down the street and I noticed that in one of the art galleries that they have there, they were having an art exhibit and the theme of that was listen to a picture. I thought it was a lovely theme, for they are trying in the South today to recover some of the rich culture that has been lost in the past few years. There has been a loss of a love an appreciation for some of the finer things in this life. And so they had this art exhibit in downtown Atlanta. And so I went by to listen to the pictures. I felt that my culture was just worn a bit thin in places, and so I went by to look at the pictures, and I found out one or two things. I found out that there you found the two extreme schools of artists and art critics today. There is that school that's known as the old-fashioned, and then there's the modern school. The old-fashioned school is mild, the modern is wild. The old-fashioned believes in art being photographic. The modern school believes in it being surrealistic, and they emphasize the impressionistic and the expressionist school. Matisse, they told me, is the one who represents that. Or if you want to put it like this, that is the old-fashioned, the concrete, and that is the modern, the abstract. And it reminded me of a story I'd heard of a contractor who loved children, loved to work with children. And he put on a sidewalk one day, and the cement was fresh, and while it was fresh, some kiddos came along and did what, you know, they do. They put their feet down in the fresh cement. And my, when he found it out, he made quite a bit of to-do of it. The fact of the matter is, he was in a rage, and a friend said to him, said, I thought that you loved children. He says, I love them in the abstract, but not in the concrete. (laughs) And so this school is a school that loves art in the abstract, but not in the concrete. And honestly, I found out that I have no real appreciation of modern art. They can paint a picture today of Whistler's mother and it can look like a dish of wilted artichokes. In fact, that's the way it did look. She wasn't even sitting in the chair. She was off of a rocker, and so was the artists, for that matter. They were all off their rocker. May I say to you that our Lord drew pictures. Some think that the pictures that he drew belong to the old-fashioned school photographic. There are others that think that the pictures that he drew belong to the modern school, the abstract. I do not know which side you'd want to take. The only thing I'm concerned about tonight is to look at one of his pictures. He painted with words. He never painted, really, with colors. The only time he ever wrote was, you will recall, he wrote on the sand and The careless feet passing over it rubbed that out shortly afterward, but he did paint pictures with words, and they were colorful words, and the pictures were in bright colors, if you please. Now, Dr. Luke is the one who majors 
in the pictures that our Lord painted. For Dr. Luke, a medical doctor, a scientist, and also an artist, he had an appreciation himself of the finer things. He records all of the songs of Christmas, and he's the one that gives us the glorious parables that our Lord gave that no other gospel writer gives us. And we're looking tonight at one of those pictures. Now, the picture that we're looking at is the one that has been called by men the prodigal son. Actually, it's not just a single picture. It's really three pictures. It's a picture that he, as he began, Dr. Luke says, he spake this parable unto them, saying, and he didn't stop with one, he gave three. And you have the picture here of the lost sheep, the picture of the lost coin, and the picture of the lost son. And they're all in one frame, they're one parable. That is what is known as a triptych. Many of you folk that can go back quite a few years remember that years ago that you used to have in the parlor the three pictures in one frame called the triptych. I used to visit my aunt, and I remember seeing a picture like that that she kept in the attic. And that's where they used to make me sleep when the house was filled up with relatives. And I always looked at that picture because it was a very interesting picture. It was really a picture of the prodigal son, but three pictures of him there in one frame. That's what's known as a triptych. Now you have here, really, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, and they all belong together. They really constitute one picture. But tonight we are just going to take one-third here, and this is a picture that's a talking picture, and it's a moving picture, and it's a triptych, if you please. I would want you to look at it. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And immediately he begins to put the background on the canvas. And I see a home, it's a lovely home because this is the home of the Father, the Heavenly Father. And it's a glorious home. It's a home that has all of the comforts and all of the joys and all of the love that ever went into the home, for it's the home that's the heavenly home. In that home there's a certain man, and that's the Father. That's God the Father. And this Father had two sons. He's got more sons than that, but these are representative, you see. One of these boys is called the elder, and the other's called the younger one. And this is the home that we're looking at. We see the lovely home, and out in front there stands the father and two boys. Now let's let our Lord put some more in the picture for us. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Now we have two pictures here. The first picture is, again, in the background is this lovely home, a home in which there's everything in the world that the heart of man could want. There's love, there's joy, there is fellowship, there is comforts, there is everything that the human heart could want. But this younger boy does a very strange thing. This younger boy says, I'm tired of the discipline. I don't like it here. I feel like I'd like to stretch my wings. And I've been looking over the pasture, and the grass over in the other field looks to me like it's lots greener. And I do not know why that's true, but friends, 
to you and me, the grass in the next pasture always looks greener. That's the reason tonight most of us are in Southern California. And believe me, if you came from Arizona or if you came from Texas, the grass is greener out here, let's face it. But that's exactly what it always looked. The boy looked out from home and he said, if I could only get way off yonder on my own and I could just stretch my wings, it'd be wonderful or it'd be glorious. And he didn't like it at home. He fell out with his father, lost fellowship with him, and he said to him, I want what's coming to me. And actually nothing is coming to him, but the father's very gracious. The father said, I'll give you your living. You're my son, and I'll be good to you. And so he gave to him his living, and the boy left with his pockets full of money that he did not work for, nothing that he'd done himself. Every bit that came to him, his father had given to him. He didn't get it by his ability. He didn't get it because he was clever, and he didn't get it because he'd worked hard. The money he had in his pocket was because he had a very generous father. And so the boy starts out for the far country. Now our scene shifts, and we've got to put in another picture here. And the picture is the far country, and you can paint it any way you want to. May I say to you, you can paint it in lurid colors, and many have tempted to paint it that way. And I do not think that it's over-exaggerated to paint it in lurid colors. This boy knew what it was to have what the world calls a good time. He made all of the nightclubs. He knew cafe society. He had money, and when you got money, you can get fair-weather friends. And believe me, he had fair-weather friends. And for a time, he lived it up. He enjoyed the pleasures of sin for a season. There in the far country, you paint your own picture there, our Lord didn't. I think our Lord let you fill in the details there, just what he did. But I can well imagine some of the things that he did, but there did come a day when he lived it up. When he reached in his pocket, there wasn't anything left, and he's in a very bad way financially. And not only is he in a bad way financially, but the country's in a bad way. You see, that country that he thought the grass was greener, the grass has now dried up. They're having a famine in that land. And this boy does not know what to do. If you want to know the truth, he's afraid to go home. He should not have been afraid, but he was afraid to go home. Now, he's desperate. He's so desperate that he's going to do something that no man who was a Jew would ever have done unless he hit the bottom. This boy has hit the bottom. He couldn't get a job. He went around to see some of these fair-weather friends, and he said, Bill, you remember how that you used to come to the banquets I gave and the dinners that I always picked up the check? And I paid for the liquor, and I paid for the girls, and you remember that? Now, I'm in a bad way. I wonder if you couldn't have tied me over, or maybe you could give me a job. And the fair-weather friend said, I'm sorry. You say you've lost all your money? He said, yes. Well, I'm through with you. I'm not interested in you anymore. And my secretary will show you to the door. I'm through with you. And the boy found from going from place to place that he didn't really have any real friends in the far country. And finally, he ended up by going out to the edge of town, and there was a man there that was raising pigs, and you could tell it a mile away. And the boy went over to him, and he said to him, he said, I'd like to have a job. And the man says, well, I can't pay you. You know, we're having a lot of difficulty. But if you can beat the pigs to it, you can eat here at least. That's exactly where he came to. You can't get much lower than that. And when our Lord said that, 
that this man would fain have filled his belly with the swill that the swine did eat. Every Israelite, both Pharisees and publicans listening to him that day, winced. Because you can't go any lower than that. If you're a Hebrew and you'd have nothing to do with swine to begin with, your Mosaic law is shut you off from them. But to stoop to the place where you go down and live with them. That's the picture. And it's a black picture. It's a dark picture. And you see this boy that's hit the very bottom. Now somebody's going to immediately going to say, well, this is a fellow that's a sinner that's going to get saved. No, it's not. I'm sorry to tell you that that's not the picture that's given to us here at all. This is not the picture of a sinner that gets saved. May I say it to you tonight and say it very carefully? that when this boy was living at home with the father and was in fellowship with him, he was a son, and there was never any question about that. When this boy got to the far country and was out there in the far country throwing his money around, he's still a son. That's never questioned. And when this boy went down to the very bottom and hit the bottoms and out there with the pigs, and if you'd been a half a mile away looking over there among the pigs, I don't think you could have told him from a pig. But he was not a pig. He was a son. There's never any question in this story that our Lord told whether the man was a son or not. He was a son all the time. Somebody says, then, this is not the gospel. Yes, it is the gospel, too. And I will hang on to that for the very simple reason that an evangelist in southern Oklahoma many years ago preached on this. People said he imitated Billy Sunday, but I never heard of Billy Sunday, didn't know who he was. So it didn't make any difference to me who he imitated. He's a little short fella, and the thing that interested us boys was under a brush arbor was the fact he could jump as high as the pulpit. He just, just flat, just stand right there and up he'd go, little short fella. And we'd sit out there and watch him, and the next day we'd practice to see if we couldn't jump that high. May I say to you, one night he preached on the prodigal son. And that's the night I went forward. Don't tell me the gospel's not here. It's here. But let's understand primarily what the parable's about. The parable is not how a sinner gets saved. It reveals the heart of a father that'll save a sinner but it reveals the heart of a father that'll take a son back that sins. This man's a son, and we find him down in the pig pen. Now, brethren, you can't get any farther down than this man is. There's no use saying back in the first century in Jerusalem and speaking to both Pharisees and publicans, there's no use trying to describe somebody lower than this boy because in their eyes there's nobody lower than this boy. He's hit the bottom. From where he is, any direction is up. He's on the bottom. Now will you notice, he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the hus that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. Maybe you thought a moment ago I was exaggerating when I said his fair-weather friends wouldn't help him. Our Lord made it very clear they wouldn't help him. No man gave unto him. Why is it today that Christians 
sometimes get the impression that the man of the world is really your friend when he's trying to lead you into sin and lead you away from God. Why is it today that believers get that impression? Well, this boy got that impression. He was being led away from home, from his father, and farther away, and he thought these folk were his friends. Now, we don't have any letters that he wrote back to some of his friends at home, but if we'd had one, I think that he would have said, say, you ought to come over here. You know, there's some real people over here where I am. I tell you, I'm having a big time. You ought to come over. But may I say to you, the day came when he found out these were not his friends, no man gave unto him. Now that's the black part of the picture, and I think it's about time for us to begin to put in some bright colors into the picture. Our Lord always, always put a black background, and then he put the bright colors out in front of the picture. Have you ever noticed that God paints that way? Now I don't know whether that's abstract or concrete. But he always puts a black background and puts bright colors out in front. That's the story all the way through the Bible. On the blackness of man's sin, God has put the bright red of salvation. He's put the blood of Christ over the blackness of man's sin. In the epistle to the Romans, Paul puts a black background that says, black as ink. And on that he writes the story of justification by faith with letters of light, brilliant colors. My Lord painted that way. You always tell when it's God painting, paints like that. And men are beginning to learn that. Out my freeway, which is the oldest one, the Pasadena freeway, and I do feel like it's my freeway after paying taxes, that it does. I know part of it belongs to me. But, you know, they started out by having a white background and black letters and a few of the old signs left out there at certain places. But that's not the way you should paint. They are now learning how God paints. And so they've got a black background and white letters. took man a long time to learn that. But that's the way you paint. That's the way God paints. And so, on this black background, here's a boy down in the pig pen, out of fellowship with his father. He left home in a huff. He's mad at his father. And now he's going to do something about it. Let me now put the bright color on, if you don't mind. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. He came to himself. Sin does an awful thing for us. It makes us see the world wrong. It makes us see ourselves in the wrong light. It makes us see the pleasures of this world in the wrong perspective. And we just don't see right when we're in sin. And this boy, that when he was at home and looked out yonder at the far country, it all looked so good, and the grass was so green, and the fun was so keen. But now, he came to himself. And the first thing he did, he began to do just a little reasoning. He began to use a little intelligence. He said, you know, I'm a son of my father, and here I am in a far country, I'm down here in a pig pen with pigs, and back in my father's home the servants are better off than I am, and I'm his son. You know, when you begin to talk like that, you begin to make sense. And this man now acts like he's intelligent. He came to himself, and he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise 
and go to my father, and I'll say unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Now, this is the decision of the man. After he did a little intelligent thinking about it, he said, The thing that I'm going to do, I'll arise, and I'll go to my father. And when I get to my father, I'm going to say to him, I've been wrong. I know my father's not going to say he's wrong. I'm going to say I'm wrong. I'm going to say I've sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of your hired servants. If you just let me come back home and be a servant, I'd be better off than you're in the big band. And he arose, and he came to his father. Now we get into a really bright picture. This is the brightest one of all. And it's the picture of that lovely home we were telling you about that's in the background. Oh, it's a beautiful home. It's the Father's house. The Lord Jesus said, In my Father's house there are many abiding places. This is the house. The house is there in the background, and I see a father looking out the window. He's been looking out the window every day that that boy left. And do you know why he's been looking out the window? He knew that one day that boy would be coming down the road, coming home. Somebody says, do you believe that if you're once saved that you're always saved? Yes. Somebody says, do you believe that a Christian can get into sin? Yes. Can a Christian stay in sin? No. Mm -mm. Because there's a father that's in the father's house watching. Because he says, all my sons are coming home. My sons don't like pig pens because they do not have the nature of a pig. They have a nature of a son. They have my nature. And they won't be happy except in the Father's house. Only place in the world they'll love is the Father's house. And every one of my sons that goes out to the far country and gets into a pig pen, I don't care how dirty he gets. I don't care how low he sinks. If he's my son, one day he'll say, I'll arrive. And I'll go to my father. And the reason he'll say I'll go to my father because the man that lives in the big house is his father. Up to the night, after at least 6,000 years of recorded human history, there never yet has been a human pig that has said, I will arise and go to my father's house. Never. Never. Pigs love it down there. They are not going to the Father's house. They want to go to the Father's house. The only one that wants to go to the Father's house is a son. And one day that son will say, I'll arise, I'll go to my father. And he did. He started home. He arose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Maybe you thought a moment ago I was exaggerating when I said that father had been looking out the door and the window every day. He'd been looking out. Every, he saw him coming. He had compassion, and he ran and said to his servant, Go down to the branch and cut me about a half a dozen hickory limbs. I'm going to switch this boy in an inch of his life. Is that the way your Bible reads? Well, mine doesn't either. It ought to read that way. 
Under the Mosaic law, a father had a perfect right to bring a disobedient son before the elders, and he was stoned to death. This father had a perfect right. He could say, this boy took my name and my money, my substance, and he squandered it. He disgraced my name. I'll whip him in an inch of his life. He had a right to do that. This father didn't do that. This father did something that's amazing. And when I lowered, got to this part of the parable, and when he put this bright color on, it caused all of those that were present to blink their eyes. They said, we can't believe that. It's bad enough to see him hit the bottom and go down yonder with the pigs. But it's worse for the father to take him back home without doing something. You ought to punish him. That's the thing that we don't like. You ought to be punished. Will you notice what the father did? Let me read it accurately now. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I've always tried to get a picture of this scene. I have several, and only one is one that I really like because most of them make the boy look pretty decent. May I say to you this picture? Oh, he's in rags. You can almost smell him. You can smell those pigs. There's the boy. And the father goes and puts his arms around him and kisses him. And will you notice what happened? The son said unto him, Father. Hmm. How wonderful. Father. I don't care if he is a boy that's dirty and smells like pigs. He ought not to. But that one's his father. That one's his father. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Now, he'd memorized a little speech, you see. He's saying the same thing he said in the far country. I think he repeated that little speech all the way home, I think, every step of the way. He says, when I get home, I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against thee and against heaven. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of thy hard servants. He started off here. <laughs> he didn't get very far. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. And as Dr. George Gill used to say, it says they began to be merry. It doesn't say it ever ended. They just kept right on. And the boy found out that the place where you could really have a good time was in the father's house. If you really wanted to have a ball, <laughs> you can't do it in a far country. If you are God's child tonight, you can't sin and get by with it. You may even go to the pig pen, but my friend, you can never enjoy it. If you are a son of the Father, there will come a day when you're going to say, I will arise and I'll go to my Father. And you're going. And when you go, you'll do what our Lord said. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the way a sinning child gets back into the fellowship of the Father's house. In fact, it's the only way back is by confession. He has to come that way to get back into the Father's house and be cleansed and brought again. I wish tonight, and I'll just take this moment to be suggestive and close. Have you ever noticed the things the Father said he's going to do for the boy? He says, get a robe. Now, a robe was clean clothes that went on over him after he got washed. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He washes us. The one who girded himself with a towel is the one who will wash one of his sons who comes back to him. That's the one thing, and that robe is the robe of the righteousness of Christ that covers the believer. But he has to be cleansed when he's been to the far country. The ring is the insignia of a full-grown son with all rights pertaining thereto. He's brought back into his original position. Nothing's taken from him. He's brought back into his place in the father's house. The older boy, if you'll follow the parable on through the older boy, that's what he complained about. This boy ought not to be brought back, he said, but the father brought him right back where he belonged. And then he says, we're going to kill the fatted calf. There has to be a sacrifice. All of this is made possible because Jesus Christ, 1900 years ago, died to save us from sin. And my friend, tonight he leaves to keep us saved. He tonight is at God's right hand, still girded with the towel of service. When one of his gets soiled feet or soiled hands by being in the far country, and don't you think you can rush back into the Father's house and have fellowship? Now, there are a lot of Christians who think they can, and they're doing nothing in the world but presuming. They're doing nothing in the world, but it's a grand assumption. And they're saying things that are not true. They're not having fellowship with God until you and I confess our sin. And when we do, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I'm preaching tonight now to believers. May I say this and conclude? Are you in a far country tonight? and you're trying to make people think you're back in the Father's house, why don't you come home? You've got a Father tonight that won't beat you when you come home. He'll welcome you, but you'll have to come. You'll have to come like the prodigal son came. I'll arrive. I'll go to my Father. And when I get there, I'm going to say to him, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me a hired servant. And the father will say, I'd never make you a hired servant. You're my son. I'll cleanse you. I'll forgive you. I'll bring you back into the place of fellowship and usefulness. But you'll have to come. Oh, you have to come. You don't fool him. You have to come. Shall we pray? I'm not concerned tonight about anything visible from this congregation. Well, I do hope that you listen to the picture. I hope you got the message of the picture and that tonight if you are away and you know and you alone know whether you're in fellowship with the Father, you can come. You can come by confession. I do not mean publicly. Be nice tonight as you kneel at your bedside. You can come back home. That's a wonderful house. I wish I could have painted it tonight as it really is. The joys that are there. The peace that's there. 
all the anticipation that's there, the hopes that are there, and the love that's there. You'd never want to stay in the far country. Shall we pray? Our gracious Father God, we thank thee that thou art who thou art. Thou couldst punish us. Thou couldst turn us aside. Thou couldst reject us. We thank thee for thy great heart of love and for the place that thou hast prepared. We thank thee for the salvation thou hast made for us. And we rejoice tonight that if we should get out of fellowship, there is a way back for us. Make that way tonight very clear and real. And if there are those here or that shall listen in in a few moments that are out of fellowship with the Father, we pray that even this night before they close their eyes and sleep, they may come back into fellowship. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.